And good morning, Worship Community Bible Church, and wherever you might be. Good to see you here in the uh, sanctuary. Hello to those in the basement. Hello to those in the fellowship hall. Hello to the parking lot, folks. <laughs> and around the world, as we're uh, accomplishing ministry in a very different way these days. And so you keep praying for our church, and the churches around the world, and the gospel going forth, no matter what, as we uh, bring our joyful attitude to the Lord and worship Him this morning. If you'll take the, your song sheets on the back of your sermon outline, we're going to say, sing, take the name of Jesus with you.
Good morning, boys and girls, mom and dad, and grandma and grandpas, and you out in the parking lot. Good morning. I'm here this morning to talk about family. I have three items with me. A bicycle handbook, my Bible, and a wheel, a bicycle wheel. This bicycle wheel represents our family. In the middle is a hub. Allison, can you see that? Is that in the center of the wheel? Yes, it is. And that's just like we as families should keep God in the center of our family. If the wheel wasn't in the center, if that hub wasn't in the center, the wheel would become very unbalanced and wobble and possibly cause the bicyclist to fall. It's important for us as families to keep God in the center of our lives. Now, in my handbook, it says that these are called spokes. Now, there's many spokes, just like there's many of us in this room. The spokes go from the outside down, and I'm taking my finger from those in the parking lot, down from the outside into the inside to the hub. And do you see, as I go down, they get closer and closer together. And that's what happens when we, as Christians and family members, get closer to God. We also get closer to our families. Now, on the other part, it's important for us to stay connected to that hub it connects all of us, and then we are becoming stronger, like the bicycle becomes stronger. And the handbook tells me that you, Allison, all the other boys and girls, the moms and the dads and the grandma and grandpas, become stronger as we serve the Lord and stay close to the Lord. In the Bible, it says many things about families. But I picked one verse in particular in Joshua 24, 15. It says, choose for yourself this day when, who you will serve, for me and my household, or for me and my family. We will serve the Lord, Joshua 24, 15. We need to be aware as we're growing closer to God that we're also helping all of our family members grow closer to each other and doing our part to bring us close to God. Thank you, Sandy. Now, today I want to talk about people who think or think other people are the greatest of all time. Recently in sports, a new anachronym has been invented, and it's called the GOAT, Greatest of All Time, G-O-A-T. And I've heard the discussion with the Basketball Association. Michael Jordan, many believe, is the greatest of all time. But there's debates, and that's what makes it interesting, because other people think that there's another person who is even greater. And they do this in all sports. But I want to talk about the GOAT today, the greatest of all time. Boy, you know there was a very flamboyant sportsman in our lifetime, Muhammad Ali. You remember what he used to say? He said, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. He has so many famous quotes. He says, I float like a butterfly, I sting like a bee. His hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. Now you see me, now you don't. George, George thinks he will, but I know he won't. And he has some great quotes throughout his life. But he says, I am the greatest. That's what he would brag. And he would say, and I knew that even before I was. And so George, or Muhammad Ali, was just so flamboyant. And he's on the greatest of all time. And many people believe he was the goat of boxing. You know, there's been other people who have been termed great throughout history. One was Cyrus the Great. And usually when we talk about the founder of the Persian Empire, we always say Cyrus the Great, we don't just say Cyrus. How about Alexander 
the Great, who founded the Greek Empire. And he is uh, phenomenal in his life, he conquered the world in 10 years and died young. Herod the Great, who built the temple in Jesus' day. And he was known for greatness because he was a prolific builder. And so many of his monuments still stand today. Peter the Great, the great Russian czar in the uh, late 16 and 1700s. He was followed by Catherine the Great. And I looked it up and I says, who calls these people great? Well, to be a great, you got to be dead. Because it's historians who look back over the body of your life's work and they might give you that title of greatness and uh, maybe the greatest of all time. Well, in our sermon today, we're going to look at the greatest of all time. Really, the goat, if you will, of the Bible. And I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 4 through 10 this morning. And you'll see why I told you those stories about greatness right there in verse 4 when we get to it. As you know, the author of Hebrews, and we don't know who that author is, but he's writing to Hebrew, hence the title of the book, Hebrew Christians, that were steeped in Judaism, who were steeped in the Old Testament, who followed the Old Testament way of life of Abraham and Moses and Levi and the priests. These people lived outside of Jerusalem. They lived down near the Dead Sea, near the Qumran Scrolls, near, near Jericho. And many of them had become Christians and believed that Jesus was their Messiah. But they had trouble letting go of their old way of life, of Judaism, in which they were grown. You know, it's really hard to teach an old dog new tricks, isn't it? Yeah, I see all these masks you're wearing. It's really hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And boy, I tell you, it was really tough for these people to leave the Old Testament and enter into the new covenant, the new testament of Jesus Christ. And so the author of Hebrews is lovingly giving them some encouragement a little kick in the rear and say, come on, people, we need to leave that behind and move on. Well, one of the problems is that they believe that certain individuals in the Old Testament were superior, even superior to Jesus. And the whole point of Hebrews is Jesus is the goat of all time. He's the greatest. He's greater than anybody you could find in the Old Testament. And you need to move on from these Old Testament heroic figures, and you need to move on to your Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had trouble doing that. In this section, we're looking how Jesus is greater than the Levitical priestly system of the Old Testament of Aaron, the high priest, and the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. And he's showing that Jesus is greater than all of that. And so he's uh, using this historical figure in their own Bibles in the Old Testament, this mysterious person named Melchizedek. Believe it or not, Melchizedek, we're not done with him. We're just really getting started. It's going to take all of chapter 7 to kind of work through this mysterious figure of Melchizedek. And I just want to say at the outside, outset, if you get confused, that Melchizedek in either choice is fine to make. He's either actually Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, like when Jesus makes an Old Testament appearance in the Old Testament, and you don't know who this person is, but he seems like he's God. It seems like he's deity. Jesus makes Old Testament appearances in other places, and in theology, we call it a Christophany, an epiphany or appearance of Christ. You know, epiphany is the word we use at Christmas time. Would we celebrate Jesus coming in Bethlehem? Well, in the Old Testament, we call it a Christ or Christ epiphany. When Christ appeared in the Old Testament and then leaves. So many people feel that Melchizedek was a Christophany, Christ in the flesh. I mean, Christ was there. And that's great if you believe that. And I think that's a really good view. Others think he was a real person that was a type or figure of Jesus Christ. And the fact last week I'm reviewing in 1 through 3 of chapter 7 that it doesn't mention his mother or father and says he'll live forever. That wasn't literally applying to Melchizedek. It was saying we don't mention his father and mother. 
because we want everything we're saying about Melchizedek to apply to Jesus Christ, who literally was divine and is going to live forever and is eternal. So if you think he's a real person that is a type or figure of Christ, great. If you think he's really Jesus Christ, great too. So when you think about Melchizedek, you should think of Christ, whether it's a type or the reality, and I'll let you make your choice. Well, let's look at verse 4 as we get started in the introduction here. And we're going on to describe Melchizedek who was magnificent. And here it is in verse 4. Just think how great he was. So guess what we're asked to do in the Bible? Let's think about how great, not Muhammad Ali. Let's think about not Alexander the Great. Let's think about how great Melchizedek was. Now, if I was to tell you, let's think about how great Jesus Christ is, you'd be going, amen, yeah. Let's think about how great Jesus is. That's basically what I'm saying to you. But Melchizedek is either Jesus or a figure of Jesus. Let's think about how great Jesus is, Melchizedek. And so we're going to see, and he's explaining to his audience, he's greater than Abraham. No, no one's greater than Abraham. He's the father of Judaism. He's the father of our country. He's George Washington. Nobody in the Jewish faith in the Old Testament is greater than Abraham. And you're telling me that, no, that Jesus Christ is greater than Abraham? That's what I'm telling you. In the second half, in 8 to 10, we're going to see he's also greater than the Levites, than Aaron, than the high, than the high priest, the whole sacrificial system, the temple, all of that. You're saying that Mel... You're telling me that Jesus Christ is greater than the Levites and the priests, and he's also greater than Abraham? That's what I'm telling you, because I want you to leave that and go on to follow Jesus. Don't get stuck in your own ways. And as great as Abraham was, as great as the priests were and the high priest, Jesus is greater. So that is the message in this. So let's go through and look at 4 through 7. And we'll actually go through the first part of 6 here and see that he is greater than Abraham. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect the tenth from the people, that is their brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham. Abraham is the patriarch of all of Israel. He's the, he, if you will, he's the first Jewish person. He was given the promises of God, of land, seed, and blessing. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made that promise to him in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, when Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees, way over in the southern part of Iraq where I spent a year, right at Ur. I could see it over the fence of my army base. I led 26 tours out there at Ur. Right there I told the soldiers, this is where God made the promises to Abraham and established the chosen people, the Jewish people, founded on three promises. Land, I will show you a land where you will go to the land of Israel. Abraham migrated all the way up through Syria, down into the Promised Land, where he took possession of it. And Abraham was also given a seed, and he had many descendants, and became the father of the Jewish nation. And not only the Jewish nation, he also had Ishmael, who became the father of the Arab people. So Abraham is the great Semitic, all Near Eastern people's father. And I want you to know that the Islam religion reveres Abraham as their father. And so Abraham is revered in our world today by many, many people. And so here the great patriarch of Israel was the founding father. Listen to John 8, the words of Jesus. Or they answered Jesus in John 8, 33. 
the Jewish people. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. And then a few verses later in 39, they said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, uh, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the things Abraham did. So in the New Testament, Abraham is the father of the Jewish people and attested by Jesus himself. Not only that, Abraham was so great, he's the only person in the Bible called the friend of God. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, it says that they are the descendants of Abraham, and they were speaking to God, your friend. Wouldn't you love to be called the friend of God? Abraham that had that special relationship with God. One of the great hallmarks of Abraham's life is his faith. He believed even when he couldn't see. And he had unwavering faith. That is the big idea, the main thought of Abraham's life. And so here, let's think about how great Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, the friend of God. And what does it say? Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Who do you give your offerings to? It's not Rish Community Bible Church. You don't get when you put your offering in if you did this morning. If you're not giving it to the church. You're not giving it to the pastor. You're not giving it to the board. You're giving it to God. Amen? Amen. You're giving it to Jesus Christ for the kingdom's sake. And here, Abraham paid a tenth of his plunder. And we know that Abraham became a very wealthy man. He, uh, he had many descendants eventually, and he had much wealth, and he gave a tenth of his plunder to Melchizedek. Who's Abraham going to pay tithes to? How's he going to honor God, and to whom will he give a tenth to? Well, this mysterious figure, the greatest of all time, Melchizedek. He wasn't giving it to Melchizedek, the man. He was giving it to Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem, and the king of righteousness, the king of peace. All of his titles in 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 7. He's actually giving it to God. He's giving it to Jesus. Remember I said Melchizedek's Jesus, either figuratively or reality? He's giving his tithes to Jesus. And that, who these people should be worshiping and honoring. Not Abraham. It goes on to say, as we, we look in the notes, this revered man of Judaism paid a tithe to Melchizedek. But the Old Testament uh, only required that the tithes were to be collected and used by the Levites, the priests of Israel, who could not own land. Well, if you look at verse 5, now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people. Well, maybe we send out a collect. We had a knock on your door and say, hey, we're here to collect. Uh, it sounds like they weren't just giving, they were being collected upon. And who did the tithes go to physically in Israel? The Levites, the descendants of Aaron, the priestly tribe. And it says that throughout the Old Testament. It says, I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving in the tent of meeting. So in Numbers 18, 21, the tithes all went to the Levites for their service to God and to be used in the performance of the temple uh, ceremonies and to take care of them. Another reason that the Levites got this tithe was because they were not allowed to own real estate or property. When you look at a map of Israel, you'll look at where all the tribes were. The tribe of Levi had no area. There was no area in Israel that would call the tribe. But here's where the Levites lived. They lived all over the country among the people. In a way, they were the pastors of the local churches all over Israel. And they received the income of the Lord. It kind of reminds me of the New Testament pattern of receiving offerings, paying for the ministry of the church and missionaries, and supporting the pastor who does so much of the work of the ministry. And Paul affirmed that. And he said, the, the ruling elder, the full-time elder, is worthy of double honor, and he's worthy of a salary. 
And it says, do not muzzle the ox as he treads out the grain. And so we see that this template has been laid down and established in the Old Testament and then brought forth in the New Testament. In Deuteronomy 12.12, 12, it says that these Levites had no allotment or inheritance of their own. They subsisted only on the tithes collected from the people. And that took a lot of faith on their part. The people were good, and when it all worked, it worked great. So how great must this Melchizedek have been for the great Abraham to pay tithes to him? And that is the point, how great he was. Look in verse 6. This man, speaking of Melchizedek, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected from Abraham. How could Melchizedek collect tithes from Abraham? He wasn't even a Levite. More than likely, Melchizedek would become, if he were, from the tribe of Judah, the kingly tribe, hence the name Melchizedek, and Jerusalem, which would later become the tribe of Judah, near Bethlehem. And here, Melchizedek, not being a Levite, collected tithes. How is that possible? Melchizedek, not being a Levite, and by the way, was Jesus a Levite? Jesus was from Judah, and yet we give our tithes to Jesus. How are we giving our tithes to Jesus when he was from Judah? In the same way, Abraham paid his tithes to Melchizedek, even though he wasn't a Levite. By the way, when Melchizedek lived about 2000 BC, Levi wasn't even born yet. Levi was actually Abram's great grandson. So it was impossible for him to pay tithes to Levi. He wasn't even born yet. And so the first point here is he's greater than Abraham because he received tithes. But look at the end of verse 6 and 7. Another reason is he blessed Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without a doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. I learned this years ago, that when you bless somebody, oh, you know, what do we usually say? God bless your sister. God bless your brother. Who do we say blesses? God. You always invoke the name of the superior to bless the lesser. I can't bless you. I'm your peer. I'm not greater than anybody else. I can't bless you. I don't have those powers. By the way, nor can I condemn you. How many people take that curse word and, uh, and maybe the lawnmower won't, won't start and they utter that curse word? You don't have the right to condemn or to bless. Only God has the right to condemn or to bless. And here, Melchizedek blesses the great patriarch Abraham. Who gives you the right, Melchizedek, to bless Abraham? And he doesn't say, God bless you. He said, blessing be you, because he was God. Because he was either a figure of God, or he was God himself in Jesus Christ. And he blessed the great patriarch, Abraham. Well, what does it say there? He blessed him who had the promises. Land seed blessing. Abraham received the covenant of God, the Abrahamic covenant. The controlling covenant of the whole Bible. And... Here, he's blessed by this mysterious figure, how great he was. Abraham had to be, uh, he just had to marvel at himself. Who is this person? Because I'm giving him tithes. He lives in Jerusalem. He's a mysterious person that we only found two times in the whole Bible. In the Old Testament, Psalms 110.4, and then in Genesis 14.18. And then we don't hear about him until Hebrews. Here we are for the third mention of him in the whole Bible, but how great he was. The greater is also, the greater always blesses the lesser person. Because Melchizedek did not swear by one higher than himself, he was a type or was the pre-incarnate Christ of Christophany. How great he was. So no matter what your view, how great Melchizedek was that even Abraham paid tithes and received a blessing from him. 
Well, I know that all of you want to receive a blessing from God, don't you? Don't you want to be blessed by God? Only He can bless you. No priest can bless you. No pastor can bless you. No human being can bless you. When somebody sneezes, what do you say? God bless you. Only God can bless. And you need to seek God for His blessings. And because He's the greatest of all time, you need to pay tithes to Him. You need to honor Him and give Him your life. Not just your money, but your life. And everything you owe is due to Melchizedek. Let's look in verses 8 through 10. Not only is He greater than Abraham, He was greater than the Levites. Verse 8. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. Well, guess what? The Levites were mortal men who lived and died. And they came and they went through the centuries. There were many high priests of Israel. Begun with Aaron, the high priest. And then his sons. And you go on down through history and you see all the different line of the high priest until you come down to Jesus' day, Caiaphas, and his father-in-law, Anna. And you see uh, this long, long line of succession of high priests and priests. Well, we read here that these men were mortal and they died. But in Melchizedek's case, he's declared to be eternal, alive, living never dies. That's why he's the greatest of all time. And we know that Jesus lives forever and that he is eternal and that he has an indestructible life. Look down in verse 23 in Hebrews 7, would you? Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. So later on, he's going to double down on this argument that death prevents these men from continuing in office. And look down in uh, verse 24, the next verse. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. So in contrast to the Levites, Jesus lives forever, and his priesthood is permanent. And it's eternal, and that's why you need to worship Jesus. That's why you need to leave Judaism. You need to leave every other religion of the world and follow Jesus. You need to leave your former way of life. You need to leave your paganism. Howard Hendricks, my teacher, he always called non-Christians pagans. Well, he's a pagan. What do you expect him to say? And I think he just liked to call it as he saw it. You know, we think of pagans as idol worshipers and they live out wherever they live, you know, uncivilized people. He said all non-Christians are pagans. And he, he's, you've got to leave your paganism. You've got to leave all of these other ways that people say lead to God. And you need to follow the greatest of all time. Greater than anything, greater than Judaism, greater than any other religion of the world. You need to follow Jesus Christ. For he's the goat, the greatest of all time. And so, what do we read about Jesus? He's living today. Look in verse 16 of chapter 7. It says that one who has become priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, that's the Levites, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. The Levites served because they were descendants of Levi the son of Jacob. But Jesus is a descendant. He is of no one. He's eternal. He had no beginning and no end. He's God in the flesh. And he has an indestructible life. Oh yes, they crucified him on the cross in his humanity. But Jesus was before Bethlehem. He was in the Old Testament. He was before everything. And there's a verse that I didn't put down. Before Abraham was, I am. There's a verse. He's the great I am. He always has existed. And even before Abraham. And here Jesus is our high priest forever. 
based on his indestructible life. And in verse 24, he lives forever. And so why are you worshiping the priestly system of the Levites? Why are you so infatuated by Abraham as great as he was? Jesus is greater than both of those great institutions that Judaism is founded on. And you need to leave him and completely follow Jesus Christ. So many want, people want to become Christians, but they want to bring some of their old way of life with them. Their old habits, their own funky beliefs about things. And a lot of people have quirks and idiosyncrasies about them, and it's like, where'd you, where's that in the Bible? Where'd you get that? And just because you were taught it doesn't mean it's true. And a lot of people carry in a lot of baggage with them into Christianity, like these uh, Essene Old Testament Christians that he's writing to in this book. Leave it all behind. Get re-educated. Come into the church and learn what the Bible has to say and accept it as truth for you. And we'll follow Jesus, who is the greatest of all time. Verses 9 and 10. Jesus is greater than the Levites because they were mortal. And also, this is a little crazy, quirky fact. Levites also paid tithes. You know, I got when I first became a minister, I said, well, I don't have to pay tithes. I'm a pastor. I receive them. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We've always rendered unto God what was his due. And I go, well, I would tell the church treasurer just to pay me 10% less. Then I don't have to pay taxes on it. Oh, man, your mind does crazy things. <laughs> your mind does crazy things. And I think I was taught well by my parents. And we have always tithed our whole lives. It's our habit. It's our custom. We don't even think about it. It's our way of life. And we were always been challenged. So don't give 10%. The Bible says give liberally. I always try to round it up. I always try to give more. And God has blessed us abundantly over all these years. He really has. You cannot outgive God. Well, look at this curious couple verses in 9 and 10. One might even say that Levite, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Well, that's kind of unusual. They collected, but then they paid it. And look at verse 10 to put that together. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Remember, Levi was the great-grandson of Abraham? But it says, if Levi was there, potentially, in the loins of Abraham, he was a gleam in Abraham's eye, if you want to put it that way. And this goes back to Jewish custom. Let me uh, read this. I got it from a commentary this week. Because of the strong Jewish concept of family solidarity, one could even say that the Levites paid tithes to Melchizedek. For Levi was in the body or the loins of their great-grandfather Abraham. Because of family solidarity, therapy, it's as if Levi was there and Levi was paying tithes along with Abraham to Melchizedek. So he's trying to show them, listen, you revere the priesthood and Levi and the temple and the sacrifices as Jewish people. But even Levi acknowledged how great Melchizedek was by paying tithes 200 years before they were born through their great-grandfather as if they were there in his loins and they gave him the tithe. How much more should you say how great Jesus Christ is? How much more should you pay your tithe? How much more should you seek the blessing of God in your life? How much more should you leave away, leave behind your paganism, your curious thoughts about things? that aren't biblical sometimes, and say, I need to be taught. I need to change my way of thinking. I need to change my life. I need to fully convert 
to Christianity and to being a Bible-centered Christian and go to a Bible-preaching church and learn the Word of God so I can become just like Jesus Christ and follow His footsteps. And all God's people say, Amen. That's the message here. In the same way, weren't we all in Adam, in Adam's loins? Adam was the father of the human race in the Garden of Eden. And we were there, potentially, <laughs> as future human beings in Adam. And Adam sinned. It says, if I sin too. Hebrew, or Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, we all sinned. And that's why all human beings are sinners, because our representative federal head, I'm using some theological textbook language on you, our representative federal head, Adam, sinned, therefore we all sinned. And you go, well, if I was there, I wouldn't have eaten the apple. I wouldn't have taken it. And I'm saying, yes, you would. <laughs> and you did, in God's word, according to Romans 5. In the same way, when Abraham paid a tent, Levi was in Abraham, and he paid a tent. And so, maybe the Levites aren't as great as you thought they were, you Jewish people, because even he honored God. And when God blessed Abraham, he blessed Levi. And so, I want to have a blessing from Jesus Christ. I want to honor him with my tithes, respect, praise, adoration, and worship. And I don't want to worship anything else. I don't want to praise any other human being who are mere mortals. I want to give all my praise and worship to the eternal, indestructible Jesus Christ, the greatest of all time. Well, if you're in an arguing mode, you could argue, well, guess what? Jesus was in the loins. I read this in the textbook, so I read it to Jesus was in the loins of Abraham. Because Jesus was humanly a descendant of Abraham. Check out Matthew chapter 1 1. The genealogy of Jesus Christ begins with Abraham. And he was in Abraham's loins. And so are you saying that Jesus paid tithes to Melchizedek? That Jesus paid tithes to himself? So maybe they would like put Jesus down and say, well, the same argument would apply. But the commentators reply that Jesus was only a descendant of Abraham in regard to his humanity from Bethlehem and Mary, not as the eternal God. And so I think that can solve that problem for you. Well, accordingly, Christ's priesthood was not after the order of Levi because they died. They were mortal people. Christ's priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. A whole new order. It's after himself. If you believe Melchizedek is a type and figure, or actually Jesus Christ himself, he created his own new order. And Jesus Christ is the founder of that high priesthood. And I want to review for you from last week that Jesus is both the king of Jerusalem, and he's also the high priest. He held both offices. I commented from history. How many of the popes wanted to also be the political king and have both the political office and the religious office. And those were some of the most corrupt popes in the Middle Ages. And some of those popes crowned the kings of Europe and actually invested them with power. And who puts the who really holds the power? The man with the crown on his head or the person who puts the crown on the head of the king. And these middle age, uh, in the Middle Ages, these popes were very powerful. And there was a historical fact called the investiture controversy on who gets to crown the kings and where the popes wanted that power. And all through the Old Testament, God separated the political power from the religious power. And when they violated it, God condemned them, like King Saul, who was the king of Israel, but sacrificed animals for the people. And he lost his kingship because he sought both offices. I want you to know that Jesus Christ holds both offices because he's God. He's our high priest. He's also our king. And we were along. And you can worship him. You can place him in high regard, the highest regard, 
for he is God himself. Because Melchizedek, the type, the figure, was so much superior to Abraham and the Levites, I think that's been well established from these verses, how much more is Christ the reality superior to Judaism, Abraham and Levi? He is the new covenant that has surpassed the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Let me say it this way. The New Testament has surpassed the Old Testament. And Jesus said on the night before he died, at the Last Supper, as he held up the chalice with the wine in it, he said, this is the covenant, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. Jesus Christ is the new covenant. He's the new way that is superseded the old way because he lives forever and it's eternal. We're told back in verse 4 to wrap things up. Let's think about how great he was. How great was Melchizedek? He was the greatest of all time. He was Jesus Christ. And if he wasn't literally Jesus, he was a prefigurement of him. He was an example of him. And he was a mysterious figure that alerted us to how great Jesus was. And so the author's telling these people, you know there's someone in your Bibles, in your Old Testament, in the Torah, the Jewish Torah, that it was even greater than Abraham and greater than Levi. That's who you need to believe in, Jesus Christ. These people were already Christians, but they were still dabbling in some of their old ways. And he said, leave Leave it behind. You know, when you become a Christian, don't you want to go all the way? Why would you go part way? Why would you just, you know, I'll get my toe, I'll stick my toe in the pool. I'll just go a little way. I think that's why I became a pastor. I think that's why I wanted to go to Bible college. I think that's why I wanted to go to seminary. I think that's why I got a doctor's degree. I wanted to go all the way. And God's calling is upon me. And I knew that. And I encourage you, in whatever way you can, go all the way to Jesus Christ. Learn all you can. Study all you can. And esteem Jesus all you can, for he's the greatest of all time. All God's people say. Amen. Take your uh, hymnal on the back of your sermon outline. And we're going to sing a song that has the word great in it. Our great Savior. And he is the greatest of all time. Jesus
It's okay to say he's better than Levi. It's okay to say that Jesus is better than any person you can name. For he is God who lives forever with his indestructible life. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I pray that you would ask him into your heart and life. That you would become a Christian. And leave all the pagan behind you. And go all the way. And don't just go half-heartedly. But be totally dedicated to him. Seek the blessing of God. Seek the blessing of his hand upon your life. Honor him with your tithe and offering. And God will watch over and bless you with your life. Lord Jesus, we pray for your blessing to be upon us. We pray for you to be strong in this world that's going the wrong direction. And we know where it's headed. It's headed to the events described in the book of Revelation, followed by the second coming. It does not surprise us that there's so much chaos and turmoil in our world today. But Father, I pray that you would help us as Christians to keep our eyes upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith, our great high priest, our great King of righteousness, we honor you and we ask your blessing upon our life today. May we be the light and the salt of the earth, and may we do good for someone this week as we await your coming. Give us the strength and resolve each and every day to live for you, and we ask for your blessing this day. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you.